vector in cDNS is a combined query and response. And from there, we proceed to abstract common data where we can to further reduce the volume of data being stored. The basic storage format we've adopted for cDNS um, is CBOR. Now, for those of you who haven't come across it, it's a, serial, it's a binary serialization format roughly comparable to JSON. There are quite a few similar formats. The reason we've chosen CBOR um, is it's an ITF standard, so we do actually have a document telling us what it ought to look like. It's very simple, and it's simple to implement. Uh, if you go and search the CBOR website, you'll find references to libraries in at least 16 different languages. In fact, should you want to try CBOR yourself, um, I suggest you do what nearly everybody does, including me, and that's just write your own, um, tailored to your particular requirements. Um, you're probably talking 100, 200 lines of code. It's not a problem. One of the other blessings of, CD, of CBOR I'd like to point out at this point is CDDL. This is a data definition language. There's a draft in progress on it at the moment. And it enables me to write a formalized description of what is in a CBOR file. And, ver and thankfully, there is tooling so that I can verify the data I'm producing corresponds to this data description. And finally, the other nice thing about CBOR, should you need it, is that the conversion to JSON um, is obvious and relatively straightforward. Now, a brief overview of the format itself, which looks a bit gnarly, and to be honest, it probably is, but um, it's simpler. It's actually not too bad if you get walked through it. So we start with the basic unit of a query response. We gather these into blocks, into blocks of a certain number of query responses, typically five to 10,000 of them. The query response contains the basic query and response information. From this, we're abstracting commonly repeated a lot of commonly repeated items out into what we call a query and response signature. So queries which have the same signature will, will use the single stored copy of that signature in a CDNS file. Similarly, we common up IP addresses, names and R data strings, and class type information as well into separate tables. CDNS only option, has the option, but it is just an option, to store the full set of RRs in query and response. They, again, are a separate data item, and where we can, we common up that data. So the big question, of course, is how well will this work? Um, and I, I think it works reasonably well. Um, we'd always intended that CDMS would be used in an environment where you're applying general purpose compression to the file after generation. So we're including here um, data on not only the raw site file sizes we're generating, which as you can see is a significant improvement, but it's an improvement that is maintained after compression. And importantly for our use case, the time and CPU resources required for the general purpose compression are much lower. So we're reducing not only the file space and the network resources we need to use, but compared to compressing PCAP, we're also significantly reducing the CPU we use as part of the capture. So our headline is that CDNS works out somewhere typically between 30 and 40% of the size of a PCAP, and it uses about 25% of the system resources to create it as a PCAP. CDNS, there's a draft, there's a draft in progress. There's a brief history. The, situ, the, the position we are at now is that it moved to working group last call at the IETF in July. And uh, this month has, been, has proceeded to ISG last call. 
There's the uh, a reference to the, uh, for the, the draft, should you choose to go and read it. We have two, <coughs> we have some uh, tooling written in C++. It's open sourced and it's available on GitHub. Compactor, which listens to the network and writes CDNS files and can optionally compress them as part of that executable rather than calling external compression tools. Uh, and Inspector, which converts CDNS back into PCAP. We also have a third tool, which is a work in progress at the moment because we haven't actually decided what to call it. Um, this converts CDNS, basic items of uh, CDNS data to uh, text output based on a template file, and it's intended for producing formats for easy import into a database. The Compactor has been deployed on ICANN operated root servers for the last two years now, collecting CDNS, which is forwarded to some central data stores, where <coughs> and the inspector is used by Octo to convert to PCAP as input to their analysis chains. The compactor in deployment runs, is limited to a single CPU and a limited amount of memory on the DNS server. It produces an output file which at the moment is configured to write every five minutes and then these files are periodically uploaded. And here, thank you to Maurizio from ICANN, here is a little overview diagram of what's happening at the moment. With uh, the uh, server fleet collecting data, it proceeding through, through the network to land on some central servers from whence it's transferred to Octo, converted to PCAP uh, for further analysis. The second, so that's, that's what's been going on for some time now. And I'll now move on to the second part of this talk, which is our most recent work, importing CDNS into a ClickHouse database for where it can be used for ad hoc queries or Grafana visualization. So ClickHouse, for those of you who haven't come across it, it's an open source time series, basically SQL, column series database. We evaluated several different databases at the start of this project, um, and ClickHouse was the clear winner, I have to say. Um, no doubt about it. Um, on performance, uh, particularly at the time of evaluation, just simply the performance of import into the database and ease of use. There is a Grafana plugin, you have an SQL interface, well, SQL-like interface, it is pretty much SQL, for doing ad hoc queries. Now, at this point, I have to stop and say thank you very much to Cloudflare, because Cloudflare are using ClickHouse, and Cloudflare have contributed to ClickHouse quite a few of the essential, uh, essential functionality that we're using as part of this project. So, Cloudflare, thank you. Um, ClickHouse is also being used by NIC Chile research labs on their DNS Zeppelin project. Um, and I have to say, if you're after a time series database where you want to put a lot of data into it, you really should check out ClickHouse. One of ClickHouse's other um, killer features for us is that it, ClickHouse can, be, can perform on insert data aggregation for you, aggregation being simply a SQL materialized view and, a and some specialized storage engines. We are currently doing per second aggregation on particular quantities. Now, this is, this is highly useful um, because although ClickHouse is amazingly fast at doing searches, even so, when you're, when you're up at the billions and billions of records and terabytes of data, um, to, get, uh, to get speedy responses to queries which you kind of need for visualization, we've, we've found you still need to have some kind of um, aggregation happening. So here we're giving you just a little flavor of how ClickHouse performs. We're running it on a four-server cluster 
We're adding 10 billion or so records a day. Um, for those of you who remember the start of this talk, um, when I said that LROOT, uh, the ICANN managed root server, manages about 9.5 billion queries a day, we are actually storing data from a couple of other services on there as well, which is why this figure is larger. We're finding we're consuming about one terabyte of data per 40 billion records. ClickHouse has the option of configuring some uh, on-the-fly compression for its column storage. We have it configured to use Z standard compression. And a sample query speed, counting all the quad A queries that you see in a week's worth of data, you can see the difference that aggregation makes. The, um, the cluster takes about 30 seconds to sort through the raw data. Aggregation, and we're storing per second counts of each <coughs> query type in the data, reduces that to about 0.3 of a second, um, which is a very worthwhile speed up, indeed. So we have a Grafana instance standing in front of this. And uh, here you can see some sample output from Grafana. This is not doing anything complicated Grafana. We haven't done any programming work ourselves on Grafana at all. This is just using the Grafana and ClickHouse plugin out of the box. So Grafana here, just to give you an example of how that display was produced, you can see we're generating it from actually a relatively simple SQL query. Um, there is a merciful amount of non-rocket science going on here. Grafana provides us with some flexible dashboards so we can generate um, multiple different um, uh, plots that may be of interest to people at particular times when significant events occur. I couldn't possibly comment on what significant event this one was. So, summary, we'll wind up. CDNS is in use. It's out on there on the ICANN managed root server and has been there. We have experience of running it for, for the last two years or so. ClickHouse is definitely our database of choice for our Wombat project. Um, it has no problem keeping up with the data import rates we require. Um, the, the, the main amount of time taken is turning the CDNS into a data, into data uh, format suitable for import. Aggregation is a really nice thing to have in that database. We are planning to open source uh, the Wombat project at some point in the future. Um, in point of fact, I would have to say, don't get too wildly excited about this. Um, the essence of the Wombat project is some Python scripts uh, devoted to wrangling the data received, um, importing into the database, and managing this in a, uh, <coughs> managing to queue the work required in a uh, su suitably friendly manner for the service. So. It's some Python and not a great deal of it at the moment, but who knows where this project will go over the next year. So, thank you very much again for being here. And, uh, whoop. If there are any questions, I'd love to hear them. <laughs> if anybody else would like to talk ClickHouse, I'd love to talk ClickHouse. Uh, Olar Gumason, Cloudflare, thank you for your kind words. Very glad to see that uh, you have good experience with ClickHouse like we do. Uh, and uh, yes, it's a great tool. It has its own rough edges still. Oh, oh, yeah. It's, but it certainly has a, it certainly has some interesting rough edges. Yes. Um, but it's, you haven't hit any of them yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but in, in in terms of its raw capability. It's, yeah. uh, but I have a question. Yeah. Uh, the sheep or format. Uh, yes. I see you are uh, storing files and then sending, uh, compressing them. Into it. Have you ever looked at using C4 as a live stream format? Uh, we haven't. It's, it's not something that um, we can do as part of our deployment environment. So the, the, need has never, the need's never arisen. That's all. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Uh, Peter Lexus Power DNS. Do you have uh, an indication of the hardware you're using for your ClickHouse cluster? The, yes, the, the, cluster, the cluster machines are now off the top of my head, they're 32 core servers with SSD storage. 
uh, regular Xeons. Um, I can't really comment more than that. If you, if, you, if you want to find me afterwards, we can go and dig out the exact specs, okay? Uh, Matt Ponset, uh, thanks very much. This sounds really interesting. Um, you, you mentioned that uh, the conversion back to PCAP for analysis is lossy. Can you say a little bit more about what exactly is lost in that? Okay. Um, the, the main thing is simply the information that's not stored uh, in CDNS. So this will be things like MAC addresses. And t the, the, yes, the two headlines would be MAC addresses and TCP session information. Um, the uh, CDNS does record whether a session happened over TCP, and in that case, the, uh, the inspector fakes up a TCP session. Um, but it is not an exact, it's not an exact copy. Okay. Um, but and similarly, of course, as I mentioned already, uh, you can optionally choose to store or not to store RR sets um, and query RR sets in the format. So if the data is not present, we can't reconstruct it. But in terms of, in terms of full fat collection, the lossiness is the um, IP level and below. Okay, so not, like, not things that are likely to be of interest to anyone looking mm, specifically at the DNS data. Mm, yeah, nothing, nothing in the DNS data yeah. specifically. Okay. Are we evidence, uh, Pasley? Um, so my question about the is about the uh, CBOR, um format. Yeah, I understand it has an extensible tag registry, so you can define your own uh, data types essentially. It it does. We're not actually we're not actually making use of that. Yeah. So my my okay. question is um, is there any interest in adding um, DNS's uh, some of DNS's more esoteric uh, <laughs> wire format encoded. Uh, Protocol that, elements to the Seaboard tag register? That's, that's an interesting idea. Like, it's, not, it's not one we've considered. Say, like, wire um, format DNS names or have an interesting <laughs> encoding. Well, in, in fact, actually, at the moment, inside, inside CDNS, um, we are converting from wire format. Um, we have to expand wire format anyway because we, cannot prefer, we, we, we don't preserve compression inside CDNS. Um, the inspector, in fact, will try and regenerate uh, compression. Um, it, um, it essentially has a go. It looks at the size of packets, that it, the size of DNS messages it's producing, compares those to the size of... Me the size of the message is one of the bits of information it sees. So it looks at the size of messages it's producing and uses some heuristics to try and work out what sort of compression, what server generated the compression, so we can have a fair go at mimicking the output, the compression, uh, the, uh, the, the label compression used by bind and not and uh, unbound. Uh, it's not exact, but it's, it's usually pretty close. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, Jeff Westhead, Microsoft. I'm just curious uh, how you deal with not having uh, UDP and TCP headers and other transport information, and how you deal with malformed queries. Malformed queries is an interesting one. We do have a specific data type within CDNS for storing malformed messages, because, yeah, as, as, you, as you can see, um, we are relying on being able to correctly parse a message. And at the moment, if the message cannot be correctly parsed, uh, there is an option to just simply uh, simply store the raw message data inside the file. Um, it's an option we have switched on at the moment. We're not actually, I don't think, doing anything particular uh, with the data stove, with that, with that data so far. So in other words, yeah, we've thought about it. There's provision for it, for storing the data. Um, I can't say we've got a large amount of experience of uh, trying to do something with that data from that point onwards. And uh, is there any sampling, or are you capturing everything? We're capturing everything. Our, our brief is to capture everything. Okay. Great. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Hi, Matt Weinberg from VeriSign. Can you talk about how you support Dittle? We support Dittle. Um, uh, Dittle is currently supported by uh, providing PCAPs generated by inspector. Um, there is an option in the... Um, in the processing that happens uh, once the files have been uploaded to the central data stores, uh, 
there is an option where a date range can be configured, and during that date range, PCAP will be generated as part of the uh, processing that also uh, now leads to import into the Wombat database. So the PCAPs that are coming from the ICANN managed root server into DITL at the moment are PCAPs generated by Inspector. They're not the uh, original captures. Well, it's, it's not the original wire right. because that's gone. Got There's it. only CDNS is being uploaded. Okay. Okay. Warren Kamari, Google. I also help USC run BRoot. So you said you might be open sourcing this sometime. Any idea when? <laughs> <laughs> I, it depends when the project's finished. Uh, or rather, um, sorry, the, the, the stage we're at at the moment with Wombat, um, the, you know, the com Compactor and Inspector are already open sourced. Um, we'll probably open source the uh, templatized text converter um, either later on this year or early next year. Um, the, the rest of the project, I, I don't know. We don't work on it continuously. So, <laughs> um, but I imagine that once we've had, uh, it, it's been running in um, what is probably going to be close to its final production form um, for the last month or so now. Uh, we've had a, prior to that, we had a prototyping uh, data, a prototyping period where we collected uh, about five months of data or so. But anyway, um, once it's all settled down, then I think we'll be, I hope we'll be open sourcing it at that point. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you all very much. Our next presenter is Mike Schiffman of Farsight Security. Uh, the title of this is Real-Time Detection of Internationalized Brand Abuse. Thank you. Uh, Timekeeper's right there. Cool. Timekeeper is going to be important. Uh, I cut this presentation down from about 80 slides to 58 slides. Um, I'm going to be skipping around a bit. So good morning, everybody. Um, We'll be talking today about uh, real-time uh, internationalized domain uh, abuse, specifically homographs. Uh, this is my first time at OARC, so quick ob obligatory uh, bio slide. Um, only big takeaway here, uh, I'm uh, with Paul Bixie at Farsight, uh, working on fun DNS-related things. So to kick things off, um, uh, the goal of the IDN effort, this is from uh, IDNA 2008. Um, RFC 5894, favorite quote to sum it all up. Uh, the goal of the IDN effort is to be able to form a usefully broad range of mnemonics in a broad range of scripts, uh, but it also paves the way for stuff like this. Um, this is uh, a sample of something else we'll find here, uh, see a lot of shortly. Earlier this year, full functioning phishing site, um, coinbase.com. Uh, the homoglyph in this case is the uh, extended Latin A with a dot over it, forming the homograph coinbase. Uh, moving on, some of the other data that, um, that we'll look at. So uh, while this talk is ostensibly about real-time detection, um, it's not that interesting if I just put up a dashboard and we sat here and hunted and looked in real-time for homographs and potentially uh, uh, through all that chaff finding um, phishing sites. So what I did do is take about 20 months, exactly 20 months of data in arrears and stuffed that through the automation and uh, applied a, a number of different filters to it. And that's what we're really going to focus on today. Uh, so from January 1st, 2017 to August 31st of this year, uh, I have all of that IDN-related data. And that's what we're going to um, mainly look at. Uh, example here, uh, Fang Company, some well-known financials. Uh, what were the I, uh, homograph uh, landscape for these guys over the last 20 months? Uh, Apple being the uh, most um, impersonated brand with a total of 6,500 different um, appearances in our data. When I deduplicate that, um, there are 1,600 unique. The important takeaway here, while uh, in many cases this is apple.com or some variant to that at the second level domain, in most cases it is not, um, the automation finds the, uh, looks for the homograph of Apple anywhere in the FQDN. 
That being said, uh, we do find plenty of um, impersonations of the second level domain, some of which, depending on um, the scripts they're using and uh, how they're mixing them, um, are pixel perfect. Uh, another uh, takeaway or important thing to note here in this presentation, I'm using Lucida Grand as the font. Reason being, um, Lucida Grand, I don't know if it is, but it was the font used in the Omnibox of uh, Chrome. I wanted everything in here to be somewhat sort of WYSIWYG in terms of stuff that you might see on a web page or in the Omnibox or in an email uh, to look the same here in this presentation. Uh, important to note, uh, every, every organization that, that does appear in this presentation was um, notified uh, at discovery time and far ahead of public discussion. Uh, excuse me? Yeah. One clarifying question. Uh, is this like DNS DB, DNS DB data you're analyzing here? Yep. All right. So um, evolutionarily, this works because humans are good at pattern recognition and Unicode glyphs um, look similar to, uh, many Unicode glyphs look similar identical to others when rendered in, in many fonts. Um, skipping this. Skipping this slide. Where am I pointing this thing? Where am I pointing this thing so I can get? Uh... It's, it's radio. Oh, all right. So it's not line of sight. Okay. Uh, so here are some some samples um, from the field of uh, these were actually head fishing sites behind them. Um, the real site on the left, the homograph in the middle, uh, with the characters highlighted that were the actual homoglyphs, and then the puny code behind that. We're going to see. Um, whip through some of the uh, uh, actual sites that were behind these here in a moment. So getting to the data, um, this is all of the IDN data that we've, that we've observed in the last 20 months, 162 million total IDN observations. Uh, about 35 and a half million of these were actually unique. Um, interesting trends noticed here. Uh, looks like there's a lull in the summer months. People do less internet. Uh, don't have enough of, a, of a, a circumspect view here to really know why that is, but we'll see this trend repeated elsewhere. In terms of top-level domains, almost 1,700 uh, unique top-level domains represented in the internationalized space. Um, interesting takeaway here of the top 10, of the top six in the top 10, three are Russian language uh, speaking TLDs, ostensibly Russian language speaking TLDs. We look at that a little differently. Um, of these uh, 34 and a half million uh, internationalized domain names, about 40% belong to a Russian language, um, at least according to our data. So again, uh, probably should mention the beginning, Farsight ethos is not to assign any um, uh, goodness or badness to data. Ours is uh, observation without indictment. So just reporting the facts, wow. I really don't know what happened there. <laughs> can yeah? Can you? Yeah. Sorry, guys. Sorry. Yeah. All right. So uh, before I start talking about actual homographs, what's in a brand? Um, before we can look for homographs, we have to find, figure out what brands we want to look for. Uh, things that look like those brands. Uh, so we uh, first had to uh, figure out a, a sort of language to normalize. <laughs> Sorry, uh, to uh, to normalize this stuff. So brands and service marks are normalized as basic Latin. Uh, we consider only brands from three characters up to 24. Uh, two character brands tend to match too much stuff, so we just ignore those for now. Collapse all spaces and uh, punctuation diacritics, that kind of thing. So uh, which brands did we choose? We picked uh, about 509, exactly 509 different brands from a variety of different verticals, uh, from, uh, of course, um, banking and financial management and such, but also um, uh, airlines, pharmaceuticals. Uh, cryptocurrencies was a, a last minute ad um, several months ago because of all the fervor last year. Um, and there's been a lot of phishing uh, in the crypto world, so I wanted to see if I could instrument some of that. Um, I didn't focus on ICOs, mainly just um, exchanges. And uh, I got a lot of these from both Alexa and similar web. 
uh, manually curated deduplicated list wound up with 509 brands currently. So um, this is probably the, my favorite um, graph of this entire presentation, all of this work. Uh, it's nice when the uh, data sort of <laughs> supports the work that you're doing and says, hey, keep doing it because it looks like the problem is just getting worse. So of these 20 months starting um, in January 2017, when we only had 1,456 of these 509 brands represented in our, our data, um, that number goes up uh, three and a half times um, 20 months later. So uh, 61,000 and change uh, total observations and almost 12,000 unique ID and homographs of those brands. Uh, by sector, uh, about 20% are in banking and finance, and this makes sense. If you're going to impersonate, camp, cash park, do something, you want the most bang for your buck. So quite often um, they're targeting banking, it seems. By TLD. Uh, most are in .com, also no surprise, most of the top uh, brands that you want to look at on the internet are in the .com space, so it makes sense that the homographs would also live in the .com space. By country, by country code, uh, we used um, anything that, that uh, we looked them all up, uh, anything that had an uh, A or quad A record, we looked that up using MaxMind, um, GOIP which I think is about a 70% accuracy rate, at least the free version did last time I looked. It's good enough for, for what we're doing here, uh, broad strokes. Most of these purported to be in the US, uh, probably because cheap hosting and US-based content delivery networks, I would assume. And uh, by IP version, odd lion share. Still uh, IPv4, 90 some odd percent. So I'm going to whip through this stuff pretty quickly. Um, earlier this year, we had a fun idea is rather than take this feed of JSON blobs of ID and homographs and cherry picking which ones we want to go ahead and try and look up either in an incognito browser or in a headless Chrome instance running somewhere, we decided to build automation to do this and display it um, using a WebSockets front end thingy so it would display in real time. Jeez. All right. Time to whip through this stuff quickly. Uh, so this is, this is that dashboard. Um, once you get familiar with it, the idea being this thing would live in a sock somewhere and you could just leave this thing up and occasionally pay attention to it and find interesting stuff. In this case, um, this was a phishing site that uh, Farsight reported on a few months ago in a blog article, Free Ticket Scam, which was a fork of a different phishing campaign. I believe the Free Adidas campaign, some of you may be familiar with. Renders oddly in desktop. Um, looks better on mobile, but uh, found it through this ID and checker thing. I'm going to skip ahead of this stuff. Bitrix phishing site we found. Uh, again, the Coinbase ones. Found Poloniex one. This one was always fun because this was uh, a Google icon homograph that redirected the user to a Google search for um, internationalized domain uh, domain attacks. So that was kind of fun. <laughs> Here's an Amazon one. Uh, Apple, this is uh, just a, a pop installer. Uh, this one is uh, Adware installer. They want you just just click there, please. Just click there. Just click. Nothing bad will happen to you. Again, I mentioned the free ticket scam. Delta, EasyJet, and Ryanair um, were all <coughs> observed in the IDN space. Uh, so what do we see in the daily? Um, we see around 11.5 million IDN um, observations. That is anything with a punicode encoded label somewhere in the FQDN hierarchy. Uh, 15,000 and uh, 15,465 of these are considered new, approximately on the daily. And of the brands that you see, around 3,400 of those matched. Uh, I want to quickly talk about our, our infrastructure here. Um, but I will say that if anyone has questions, since I can use all this time up, feel free to line up now, and uh, I'll sort of vet the rest of my presentation based on the number of questions. So um, how we see what we see, um, of course, us being foresight, um, we have our passive DNS uh, infrastructure and the cache misses, all that good stuff feeds this brand monitoring um, service, and inside of that, there is automation that does the ID and homograph matching. You feed brands into that. Out comes ID and homographs. You can consume that directly as a JSON feed, or you can, uh, that can be consumed by this ID and homograph checker, which you would consume with your eyeballs. 
to detect homoglyphs, first need uh, homographs. You need to build a table of homoglyphs first, uh, and we've four-step process for doing that: uh, picking your fonts, uh, generating glyphs, comparing the glyphs, and then uh, a bit of uh, art here in pruning the final output tables into hom uh, output sets into homoglyph tables, which is then consumed by the automation. Uh, choosing fonts. So uh, we're only interested in the basic multilingual plane. Currently, this effort is really focusing on homographs of basic Latin-based brands. So primarily, we're only interested in um, fonts when rendered provide homoglyphs for characters in basic Latin. So uh, BMP only. Um, we we want to pick a font kit that's going to have good coverage of the basic multilingual plane. Um, these are some of the fonts that we've had good success with, Code 2000, Unifont, Noto. Optimal glyph dimensions when you're going to render these fonts. Something too big, you might introduce artifacts. Something too small, and you might miss important details. Uh, desirable, uh, determine desirable blocks. You can exclude many blocks out of the gate, emojis, uh, street signs, things like that. Things that you don't have to worry about seeing in the DNS. Uh, you then want to iterate the, um, the blocks of interest, uh, write the glyphs to disk. Uh, it, 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 we also found it useful to actually store in memory before we wrote to disk, uh, and that way we could deduplicate all of the tofu um, pretty quickly before it got written out. Uh, and then, uh, as, the, as, as we must do, um, comparing each glyph against every other glyph ends up being a big O of n squared problem, so this part takes a while. Uh, but you only have to do it every time you're generating your corpus. After this, you can generate uh, HTMLized views of your corpus for manual inspection, Sort of like the you know factory work, work factory floor worker uh, pulling out all of the stuff that's obviously bad that the machines are no good at uh, figuring out. Remember, humans are really good at that pattern recognition. I have one single slide on mitigations because, as everybody here probably knows, it's not an easy problem to solve. Uh, my favorite uh, article about this stuff was a 2017 April 2017 registered article, and the quote was. Uh, the idea and homograph problem, the, the problem that the internet wished away. And that's pretty much true. Uh, ours is to sort of, thank you, uh, 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 you know, turn over the rock, shine the light, um, hopefully uh, stir up uh, a bit of interest around this again uh, and figure out what we can do. End user education awareness, um, sysadmin, defensive reg, that kind of stuff. Uh, we did observe some interesting, well, defensive registrations are tough. Uh, I did observe one organization, and we knew these were all defensive registrations because they all served, this, served the same EV certificate as the um, actual brand's website. So people are doing it. Um, DNS Twist, which is a, a useful tool to sort of enumerate your domains and kind of find out who's doing homograph stuff. Uh, I want to mention quickly URID. I think they, somebody told me URID folks are in the crowd here. Uh, are they? If so, uh, congrats to you guys. The only registry that uh, I know of that is doing homoglyph bundling, which is where you register foo.com, you get all the homoglyphs for free for it. So that's kind of helpful. Uh, I have a bunch of bonus stuff here, but I'm not going to have time to talk about it. Um, if anyone's interested, come find me later. It's uh, script commingling uh, and sort of the odyssey. Uh, we've gone on to, to build a detector for second level uh, script commingling, second level at the effective second level domain. And then also some uh, fun um, overflows and other problems we found in open source IDN based libraries. So if you're interested in talking about that stuff, find me later. So how am I doing on time? We're okay? Okay. Uh, so the script commingling. Uh, this is uh, primarily we're concerned with the stuff that gets registered, script commingling at the effective second level domain. The canonical example always being uh, basic Latin and Cyrillic. Uh, the Cyrillic A and the Latin A when rendered in Lucidogram, for example, uh, pixel perfect uh, renditions, uh, they're the same. So, ay, uh, this slide didn't render. Well, we're floating somewhere. Um, long story short with this uh, brief history of script commingling is that it's a known problem. Uh, someone, uh, this was provided to me by Paul Hoffman, actually, at the ICANN. So, 
It was known as a problem. Someone pointed it out. All script commingling was forbidden. And then someone said, hey, there's plenty of legitimate use cases for commingling scripts. So then all script commingling was permitted, basically. And then time passes, and people kind of went like this. So it's sort of Wild West right now. Um, but it enables far more sophisticated um, and difficult to spot homographs if you can mix Cyrillic and, pay, and, uh, and basic Latin and, and certain other scripts, Greek and basic Latin, for example. Um, and Greece is the homograph namespace, obviously. Um, I'm not gonna go into too much detail on this because it's, it's uh, Pandora's box, but the long story short is uh, we built an initial proof of concept using um, the IANA uh, based on the IANA guidelines, um, ICANN documents, Unicode consortium documents, and it turns out after vetting this through um, people uh, in the ICANN and elsewhere that uh, this is basically wrong. Um, you need to fold in IDN tables as well. Uh, so this is an, is an ongoing effort, and uh, if you uh, at all follow Farsight or Farsight's blog, stay tuned because we're still working on this one. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pause right now and take questions, and then if I have more time, I can talk about the, the overflow stuff. Cool. Um, Alex Mayer from Nikita.at. Um, that's interesting work. I was wondering, did you also look at the Confusables table that's provided by Unicode itself? Yeah. Whether that's I useful or? Yeah. So I, I did have a, a slide back there where I mentioned it, and we wrote a research paper a few months ago where we, we looked closer at the Confusables and the, the prevalence of confusables in the idea in homographs. And I think we came up with a number, something like 90% of homographs contain confusables. It, it's helpful. Um, and the confusables okay. is also forms a subset of the homoglyph tables that we use. Yeah, okay, cool, thanks. Thanks. Uh, Jacob Zach from CIRA. Uh, just a quick comment. So CIRA has what we've done is we've reserved homoglyphs of various IDNs. So if a domain is registered, uh, you know, another actor cannot register a variant. Uh, when it comes to uh, bundling everything together and handing that to the registrar or to the registrant, uh, we decided at that time that that would be ripe with abuse as well and that uh, not necessarily in a uh, spoofing of a domain for phishing purposes, but if uh, an actor were to have the rights to a ton of different domains, all with the variations, there wouldn't be a penalty if one of those variations was doing something bad. The only, uh, I, I, that's a good point. And I, the only thing I can offer for that when we, we thought of this is that at least you only have one place to go to find the, the, the uh, person who's registered or an organization that's registered. Um, this brand or all of these these domains, um, I, but you're right. I mean, there's no there is no silver bullet here. Hi, uh, Leslie Daigle, Thinking Cat Enterprises, and I have a comment and a question. And the comment is, having lived through that era of the IETF uh, defining the IDN spec, where it certainly spent a lot of time considering edge cases and all of these things, yep. and why are we here, and what is the Earth. Um, there was also, it was also really hard to sort of pull ourselves out of that deep, deep hole because it's like these were all hypotheticals. So the comment is it's good to actually see data that the things about which there were concerns are real and how real they are. And the question is, now what? Any thoughts on, you know, other than detecting that these things are happening, any thoughts on where from here? Well, um, that's why I only have one slide on mitigations. Um, I would love to have suggestions from you folks on what's next because I'm happy to beat this drum and I'm happy to work with anybody and provide data. Um, I think that while I'm not trying to lump this on the registries and the registrars, uh, I think that things could get better there. While I know that there's a lot of, it's complicated, there's a lot of politicking and there's a lot of, it's very com complicated at, at that level. Um, if it can be stemmed there, it's probably, uh, a, I mean, you can get it at the source. Right, so, so one of the answers may be it's not a DNS problem to solve, right? I mean, because you can only go so far by either registering all the homographs right. or, you know, Or whatever. detecting them, right. Exactly. Yep. Um, so it, it may have to actually get kicked up a level in some sense, right? Right now we, we 
you know, recognize things literally by the URI, URI, URI in the browser bar, like maybe that's the problem. Yep. Thank you. Okay, cool. How did I wind up with so much time? Okay, um, let me, I'll talk towards this briefly. Um, so this was uh, while we were working on this uh, second level script commingling checker thing, uh, a couple of the open source C libraries that uh, were used, libpsl, libidn, libidn2. Um, the reason why both libidns were involved is because of the problem I found at the bottom. I wanted to know if it was present in both libraries, and it was. So libpsl was boring, null pointer, deref, um, no big deal, easily patched. Uh, libidn, libidn2, so this was a little more interesting. Um, the functions uh, that were responsible for decoding the Punicode into Unicode, in libidn this was called a, lib, uh, a Punicode decode, and I think libidn2 uh, put some mumbling in front of it. Um, uh, you can coerce, uh, both functions were vulnerable. Um, you can coerce them to generate, to return successfully, yet return to you invalid Unicode code points. Values that should be Unicode code points that are not because they are returning human 32s. Uh, the Unicode, uh, max Unicode code point is, uh, is far smaller than that. And the way I found this, uh, I uh, had a program, the script checker, that uh, uh, I created a static array to, um, for every single Unicode code point for quick indexing, quick lookup of that code point. Uh, and as I ran it, and it crashed on me overnight. And after doing a little bit of debugging, I found that this in the wild FQDN, uh, when its puny code was attempted to be decoded, it resulted in these code points higher than um, uh, one zero uh, FFFF. So uh, long story short, turns out that um, the Punicode RFC, while ostensibly only uh, was built and written for internationalized domain name as, a, as the ASCII compatible encoding, uh, it can, it's not clamped, it's not explicitly clamped to the Unicode code point space. Uh, and this is buried somewhere in the RFC and mentioned. Um, the Punicode, the implementations of this in libidn uh, obey the uh, pseudocode in the P RFC pretty much verbatim. So turns out that there are a large, large, large number of these. I don't know how many. Uh, I didn't. I fuzzed uh, all, all the way up to the first five characters of different Punicode um, variants, and I stopped after that because it got to like something like three trillion different possibilities. Um, there were a lot. Um, so it, it turns out that uh, it, it's a simple patch. You just need to check that your code points are um, within the legal bounds, otherwise return um, some type of error code, which is what, uh, which is what the patch ended up being. Um, but I, I offer that, is this something that needs to be called out more explicitly in the RFC as a buyer beware kind of thing? Um, I, I gave a version of this presentation last week at MOG and somebody stood up and said that the puny code RFC um, should be amended to more explicitly state this. So um, I offer that to you guys. I think that's probably not a bad idea so that future implementations don't um, fall victim to this. Additionally, if you have any applications built on top of libidn, libidn2, make sure they're up to date. This was, this, like I said, this wasn't in the wild FQDN that, that made this happen. So buyer beware. And that's all I got. Cool. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Help us improve. <laughs> Okay, our, our final morning presentation will be Sebastian Castro, Detecting Resolvers at dot .nz, not nz. Good morning. Kia ora. It's a full house. I can feel the... I've done presentations before for ORC, and you know, I, for some reason I'm quite excited about this one. So this work is two years in the making, and the title is Detecting Resolvers at Z. But uh, what we propose in here is a methodology that we can use for any authoritative uh, source to detect 
resolvers in this case, but can be to detect other stuff. Um, and effectively, I think two years in the making, and now we have some final product that we can go and share with you. I understand, hopefully you're not too hangover, uh, and you're like thinking, oh, give me coffee, please. So we will try to keep this uh, running smoothly. So what can I tell you about this is uh, probably you know DNS traffic is noisy. And there are long tails, and you no, don't know what is out there. Uh, as um, Joe Abley say yes, said yesterday, they are full of shit uh, everywhere. And, uh, and I've seen experts um, refer the, oh, yeah, all the traffic you see on authoritative name server is um, the source addresses are resolvers. Um, we don't believe that. It's not all resolvers. It's clearly there are some monitoring, it's clear some noise, and it clears some resolvers, and, but which, where is the, the proportion? Uh, in our particular case, for Doren said, as we, we develop a domain popularity ranking use, using DNS traffic, we don't want to include non-resolvers on that calculation. So we pick up the, the challenge of, can we go and find out which source address, which address in the traffic is a resolver? So the objective, as simple as you can go, be described in one line, is a classifier that will tell you with certain probability if a source address based on certain patterns is a resolver or not. One line, two years of work. But it's not a simple task because we've been trailblazing on this work uh, for a long time. It's, um, as there are multiple implementations out there. You wouldn't have as complete certainty about what the kind of the pattern of a resolver will fo follow on DNS traffic. So we started searching. We had an early presentation in ORC25 that was, I think, Dallas. And then we followed that up, uh, understanding the traffic in ORC27. And now we are ORC29 and we're finishing the work. So two years in the making. So we start digging out our DNS knowledge uh, from uh, our team, but also from our operations team. So Daniel Griggs is here, and he helped uh, help us out with this as well try to remove the noise. So we use four weeks of data for this training, and during those four weeks, we have two million unique source addresses, IPv4 and IPv6. Of those two million, 27.8%, uh, only query one domain on four weeks. 45.5% uh, only query, query send one query type. 25% only query one name server out of seven and 65% uh, only sent like 10 queries or less per day. So there's a very, very long tail. So if we remove, uh, define certain criteria of activity, we can go and reduce that to a quarter, so 550,000 unique source addresses. So then we focus on finding which are the most active. So we define active as uh, 75, they have to be traffic for them on 75% of the total hours of that period, and they have to be active at least five out of seven days per week. Uh, we established a certain criteria for weekends and weekdays, but it didn't work out very well. So we're reducing now the, the list to 82 uh, unique source addresses. So from those 82,000, we are assuming from this on they are either a resolver or a monitor. A monitor will be someone sending traffic regularly to check if the service is up in some way. And then now we start looking for features from that traffic that can help us to go and discriminate which one is which. So the data set we use is .NZ traffic and those uh, 82 unique sources uh, from last year. And we have a few known samples we curated on our own. Uh, 2,500 resolver addresses that we know from ISPs in New Zealand, the, traf the documented uh, addresses from Google DNS, the documented addresses from OpenDNS, uh, resolvers from education and research organizations in New Zealand, uh, because they are grouped in one organization, so we can got in contact with them, and collected a few addresses from RIPE Atlas probes, 
doing an experiment, and then we collected 106 addresses that are monitors. So the ICANN monitoring for the SLA, uh, Pingdom, Thousand Eyes, the RIPE Atlas probes that are doing regular monitoring, and RIPE Atlas Anchor as we are part of the DNS MON and the TLD MON uh, set. And now that we can have, we can add Cloudflare, uh, Quad9, so we have some work to do when, when we're back. Um, so using one single feature, so one ele uh, element, so you, uh, you're, what you're seeing here is um, a couple of features. So one is the number of unique uh, domain names, a source address query on that day. And in green are the monitors, and in blue are the resolvers. So, and this other feature you see here are the number of unique query types per day. So there is not a clear demarcation, but there, there are some zones there. So the green zone, the, the monitors send uh, a few queries and query a few types and resolvers are all the rest. But if we start combining features, we can go and start finding the differentiation. We added then temp uh, temporary, uh, features that are associated with time, so uh, query types and query names and query rates, um, and they're described as a time series, so we calculate the mean, the standard deviation, the percentiles for those. Uh, there are more than a few, it's not extensive, the list. And then we start working on the entropy features, so uh, as under the assumption that the resolver should be far more random than a, a monitor. So we have two features here, the, the timing entropy and the query name entropy. So the timing entropy is the lag between susceptible queries coming from the same source address. And also the same, if we see the same query for the same uh, name, what's the time between those? So our resolver will, will start sending regularly the same query. And, uh, and also the query name entropy, so we calculate the, the text similarity between queries using the yellow Win Winkler uh, extreme distance between successive queries. So we can go and determine, ah, uh, there's a lot of entropy on this query stream or a little entropy on this query stream. Are you snoozing already? Sort of, yeah. So it gets worse, don't worry. Um, <laughs> So also, so we, we did that at, 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 some, at some point, so entropy and temporal features, and we didn't get any, any good results so far. So we thought, what about variability? So how this changed through time? Uh, so we can go and, and observe the query flow, and we thought, well, a monitor will be less variable compared to a resolver on those metrics. So we added the aggregations that you saw already, but we also calculate the variance metrics. So how this change through time? So using uh, five different uh, variance metrics. So the interquartile range, so what's the difference between the uh, uh, third quartile and the first quartile, the quartile coefficient of dispersion, the mean absolute difference, the median absolute deviation, and the coefficient of variation, if you like. That's too much statistics for me. It's like 10 in the morning, Sunday, please. Yeah, you can go back to Wikipedia and find out. The, the, the formulas are kind of straightforward. And then we go and start picking the feature selection. So we had, uh, at this stage, we have like 75 different features for one given source address. And we start, need to go and find out which one are, are, are good. Um, so for this, um, we start finding which one are highly correlated so they won't add anything useful to our, our model using the F-test and the mutual information test. The F-test test for correlation that's more linear and mutual information test is a far more complex test. Uh, so the most relevant, for example, features you can see here are the, the function of TXT queries and MX queries and the standard deviation of the daily number of query types. And then you can see the less relevant um, features are the fraction of active hours and active weekdays. So we started with that idea, but the data proved us wrong. So we ended up with 50 features in different scales that need to be normalized in order to go and make it useful for uh, a machine learning model. 
and we use two uh, styles for that, the standardization and quantile transformation in order to avoid outliers. So you can get the sense, uh, you can get the sense that, that, why, that why this took like a year because we we're doing this for thousands of addresses and go and testing uh, information after and after and after. So we, we verify the f feature set using clustering, so putting addresses together. And we, ha we uh, attempted five algorithms, k-means, Gaussian mixture module, mean shift, db scan, and agglomerative clustering. And they work differently depending on the data that you have in the internal structure. And we have to evaluate the metrics, uh, we have those three. So the best model with the known samples was the Gaussian mixture with five clusters where the, the metrics are around 0 0.9, which are very good, but the completeness score is not very good because they uh, monitors they behave in two different groups. So we verify the clustering with the ground truth, and we found out, that, for example, open DNS, which we think are resolvers, they have a completely different behavior compared to Google DNS or any other resolver. And so we had this conversation with Joao um, about OpenDNS. It's like, yeah, we've seen the OpenDNS is kind of weird. So we decided, okay, we're going to take, take it out and decide later what, it, what is going on. So on this heat map, you can see the, the clustering, how the clustering is behaving on putting different uh, types of source addresses in different groups. So those dark colors you see one there with a one, that means all the addresses that they were ICANN monitors, they fit in cluster number one. And um, so all the pingdom in the same cluster, all the thousand I monitors in the, same, in the same cluster. The Atlas probes, because not Atlas, all Atlas probes do monitoring, there are few that fit in the, that cluster, there are a few others that fit in other clusters. The Google DNS and the Resolver ISPs are mostly on the uh, fourth cluster, you see there, uh, and, the, and there is a mix. So it's not perfect, but it's quite good. If we aggregate this and separate it, put everything together, so monitors and, and resolvers, you can see the cluster number one is uh, monitors, and cluster number two, number four, and maybe zero uh, resolvers or some kind. So now we have, we, we confirmed that the data is reasonably good, so we use our training data with those four week period, 50 features and a few samples to go and create a supervised classifier. So basically we go and give them the, the tags. So if any of you have done machine learning lately, um, you can spend a lot of time doing uh, training and testing features and calculating hyperparameters. Uh, so we, because we have been through this, we decided, okay, let's use this new idea of AutoML, so uh, machine learning that uses, uh, this one was using Bayesian optimization in order to go and find which are the best parameters for the classifier. Uh, in case you're interested in reading a little bit more about that, but the thing is, we created a classifier, which is an ensemble of 28 models that takes 10 minutes to train and, uh, and get an accuracy of 99%. So, okay, done. We have the classifier, it's this work, it, this is robust. Let's go and test with new data. So we train the classifier using a sliding window regularly, and it takes a few hours actually to generate the features. So the training is fast, but the generation of features is slow. And we are predicting sources using a given threshold, so we kind of raise the bar and say, we said, so if a resolve is the address, guess classifiers are resolved with a, prob with a probability higher than 70%, it's good for us. And we tried on the popularity ranking, and the popularity ranking improved vastly. But the popularity ranking is not the topic here. The topic is the detection. So, out of, uh, so we used new data, and, and of, out of 100,000 uh, different source addresses, we identified that 73,000 of them were resolvers of some time. 
And we were talking to Moritz Mueller from SIDN. So Moritz was sitting yes, there yesterday, now it's there. So we were talking about a, a different topics like, ah, oh, yeah, we use, we use the Illuminati probes for this. Um, and this is a list of addresses. Can we go and check them? And we checked them with the model, and 96% of them were identified as resolvers, which was an unexpected and in great result. So with that in mind, we are going to in incorporate this in, in, into our work. But the part I'm most excited about is that we can use this to identify all that shit in the DNS for adoption of new technologies. So when, in the case of when we don't have the telemetry to go and find out, uh, for example, a PNIC experiment to go and detect validating resolvers, it's like active probing. But we can do, do passive probing with this. We can detect uh, validating resolvers at the root zone with the day in the life data, at .nl, at .cz, or .sc traffic, they, they have high levels of DNS uh, adoption in their countries. And then we can go and collide those addresses and say, okay, this is a common pool, this is exclusive from this country, this is uh, shared across two countries, etc." We can go and measure the adoption of QNA minimization in the wild, right? We don't know a resolver that's using QNA minimization doesn't send any signal. We don't have telemetry to know ah, uh, they're doing this. It's the project from DNS and it labs, but that requires active probing. We can do passive probing and detect that. And then, I don't know, think widely, we can go and, and start a, a building this um, methodology to go and do other measurements we can think of. So we have to acknowledge uh, there's a lot of people involved in this. So this work is mainly Jing. Jing is part of uh, the research team at uh, NCRS, so I'm presenting on her behalf. She's expecting a baby, she didn't want to travel. Uh, so uh, Daniel helped us with the operational point of uh, providing a fresh pair of eyes on how to go and narrowing down the, the list of addresses. I was working on the variability met metrics that actually uh, turn into a breakthrough, so then the program, the project was a little bit stalled, and with the variability metrics, it worked. Uh, we have the help from George, so George helped us uh, checking ground truth for resolvers, uh, and Joao, so yeah, it takes a village. We were not working alone, and we've been uh, talking to people about how to do this properly, and we're happy to go and share that. It works. So they have a, we have a pl couple of blog posts if you're interested in uh, learning a little bit more about ma machine learning and clustering and some other stuff, and we will keep posting about it. And that's the other presentation, and George is already re ready to fire up. So I think you meant Jeff, not George, because I don't remember talking to you. I talked, no, it was you. Was it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's Sunday morning. Right, so. So, so I, have two, I have two different observations, and yep. one of them, it, it isn't important, but it's about a semantic, a semantic moment when we say the word resolver. Paul Hoffman has been working on this dictionary of terms and key concepts in the DNS for years. And when we talk about resolver, the moments that I think expose there are the idea, it's a thing it's in DNS emitting packets. What it emits is questions. It doesn't supply authority information because it doesn't have a local configuration that's a zone. It's emitting questions. Sometimes it keeps the answer, and when people ask questions through it, it gives them the answer from cache. But it isn't because it was told the answer as a authority statement as a zone. It's mm -hmm. because it's remembered a prior state. So in that ontology, to use that word, a resolver is a machine for asking questions. And you, you are talking about a resolver as, well, it has to be more than just asking questions. It's some kind of intermediary for other people collecting questions because you excluded the probes, the Atlas probes, that are asking questions. You didn't see them as things asking questions because you didn't see them as asking questions for other people. 
So yep, it that's feels correct. like semantically what you're saying is you're classifying different types of resolver. Not is a resolver is not a resolver, different types. I, I, maybe it's just me, but I kind of kept thinking, wait a minute, when, when I use unbound on my laptop to ask a question, I am a resolver. Unbound is a resolver. Yeah. But your classifier would probably exclude me because I am not active 75% of the time and yeah. I ask questions with different locality of reference to things that are serving lots of different people. Yeah. Do you see what I'm trying to say yeah, here? I, I understand it's the, only a semantic moment. It does not invalidate your work. Yeah. I, no, I see your point, and, 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 and it's correct. Um, in order to go and converge to a solution, we have to go and make some decisions about the semantics of what a resolver yeah. is. So, so then comes the second part of my question, which is training. And this kind of model of training detection, it's a beautiful thing, and I love this, and I think the idea of having a trained model that we can refer to is a really nice idea. But you have driven down a particular road. And yes. so some of what you're saying you'd like to look at, it feels like you're now defining it by exclusion. Because it does not fit this model, it therefore lies in the other set. And I'm sort of thinking, wow, there's an infinity of other sets out there we need to train to the other sets. You actually need a version that trains to say, is an Atlas probe. Not exclude because it's not a resolver, but you actually need the positive trainer that says, I type you as Atlas. Mm -hmm. You need both. Yeah. Nice work, though. Are you Thank sure you asked me that question? I yeah, don't I'm remember you sure. asking me that question. I have the paper trail. I have the memo. Yeah. Giovanni? Yeah. yeah. Thanks for your work, Sebastian. It's very nice, and I think it helps a lot like people who run authoritative to sift through the data. Um, yeah. Please Next. state your name. Oh, Giovanni, SIDN Labs. Um, but I think in regards to the last question, um, I think there's a difference in what you measure. I mean, you measure the last resolver that talks to your authoritative. And between that resolver, recursive resolver, uh, there's the probe, but may, there may be many layers of resolvers in between, and you Four don't care. Waters, and, yeah. and you don't care because you only see the last one. So as long as I think you probably you just say that in your research, you're fine. I mean, it's, it's totally fine. And just to give an example, I look into one specific probe, and the right, they have like three local resolvers, and up to eight intermediary resolvers, mm -hmm. the next layer. But I don't yeah. know any minute how many layers there were, because I know there were eight because I run the authoritative. So, it's very complex, but you're doing a great job for the authoritative point of view, so thanks for that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Brian, Brian Dixon, GoDaddy. Uh, this is really great work. Um, one thing I'm wondering about is um, publishing the actual results of the learning in terms of the IP addresses as a set, data set, of resolvers. Because that's interesting to operators. We have to know where we put our stuff so that people who are resolvers can get to us reliably and you know, that we comprehensively cover um, that as a, as, a, as a collection. And finding that out of the 82,000 is very good, but we wouldn't want to have to run those same things if oh, we yeah. can get access to just the data. Yeah, that's perfectly possible. We don't, I don't see any problem with that. Probably should be through ORC. So cool. it's with trusted parties, but yeah. it shouldn't be a problem. Cool, thank you. Hey, Moritz Miller, uh, thanks for the work. And I was wondering, you mentioned that uh, Power Open DNS was behaving weird or didn't really fit in your clusters. I was wondering if you dived a bit into that and figured out. Um, I don't have the details on the top of my head. So we had this discussion with uh, Joao about um, what we discovered that it seems to be the Open DNS uh, keeps states across their own instances. So they, one instance will go and ask you and we learn something and then share that internally. So the, the number of different domain names the query was kind of low compared to, for example, Google DNS, assuming certain level of uh, same scale, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and even they have, uh, the, so the variability metrics were strange even compared to a local ISP in New Zealand. Okay. So we are suspecting they keep certain information within the, them so in order to avoid, they are doing real, working really hard to avoid asking the authoritative name servers for data. So yeah. that was a high level description. Okay. 
Uh, and we're, of course, very happy to collaborate further and see maybe how our resolver matches uh, mm. with, with yours. Yeah. Great one. Great. Uh, Giovanni, again, at the end. Um, Sebastian, are you planning to write a measurement paper on that? Sorry, again? Are you planning to write a measurement paper on that? Because that would be really cool. Uh, we can talk about the yeah. paper uh, offline. But the thing is, um, so quick answer, no. All right. <laughs> if you have time, it would be nice. But yeah, uh, we, we're willing to talk to someone who is interested in writing a paper. Yeah, uh, and also another question out of curiosity. Um, you said like 20% of our uh, IPs that you saw were query one domain. Would you care to disclose? It would be okay to this. Which one was that? Just curiosity. Uh, hard code the domain or something? If, if you send me the what you want to know, I, I can answer all your questions. All right. All over, Cloud, sir. Um, really nice. Really cool. But I have a couple of questions and then one observation. Yep. As I'm listening to you, I'm thinking here, um, how can I defeat this mechanism of yours? So that was the first question. Are you thinking of a resolvers as having one address or a very small set of addresses? Uh, yeah, so at, at the moment, uh, so um, cloud DNS providers as Cloudflare and Google DNS and OpenDNS, they have pools of servers. And, uh, and what we observe is some of those addresses kind of behave in a way that looks like, like a resolver. But they can have multiple IP addresses. Uh, at the moment, we don't have a way to, for example, overlap and, and, and cluster multiple source addresses to be one resolver. But we can go and combine this work with uh, the active measurements other people have been doing to, you know what, uh, that endpoint is actually generating this set of addresses, and we can combine the time series in one and then uh, proceed with the, with the same algorithm. Um. When I was listening to it, it sounded like you had excluded IPv6 queries in the, your mass machine no. learning. No, okay. No, okay. Uh, so, if I have you have my, have a resolver vendor that decides to do a unique query address every time, the your model will, will fall apart. Completely under the radar. Yes, that's yes. correct. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Jeff. Jeff Houston, APNIC. Just on that discussion about trying to understand the difference between a cluster of IP addresses with a single DNS resolution brain behind it, mm -hmm. in other words, a brain with many slaves versus independent slaves, what we have found useful is to actually track the DNSSEC validation queries. Mm -hmm. Because what we found with a number of these server farms is that you'll find the initial A or quad A coming from IP address one, but the related, because we use unique labels, the related queries about DNS key and DS records tend to come from other addresses. Right. But the brain has been given a question to validate. Yeah. And so you can logically actually assemble these maps of both V4 and V6, mm -hmm. where you've got a cluster of query slaves sitting in front of an underlying DNS engine. And that's been useful when you see server architectures, and there are a number of them. That yeah, exactly. This. Yeah. So on, on that thought, the presentation yesterday from Willem about DNS thought was uh, I, uh, eye-opening in the sense of uh, they can go and do measure and find out these um, dependencies between forwarders. So I think we had this conversation about how do you discriminate between resolvers and forwarders, for example, uh, that um, in your measurement infrastructure you don't know so far and it's hard to know. And, and uh, I wish we can go and find a pattern that can we used to go and differentiate that, for example. So all I get to see are what I call visible resolvers, the ones that ask authoritatives. And I got persuaded yesterday to publish that list every day, together yeah. with an intensity count that tells you the relative weight of those resolvers mm, okay. against the user population, and secondly, whether there is a strong indication that they validate or not, which might help seed your work, because it becomes what we see at the eyeball network yeah, versus exactly. Versus what you see in the capture yeah. at the authoritatives. Yeah, great. Excellent. That was plenty of questions. Thank you very much. Well, very good. Yeah. All right. We have a brief announcement from Peter Van Dyke. Uh, last night at the social, we had an opportunity for as many pizzas as we could get in one room. We had five of us standing together. 
get two of us on stage right now. If you're a Pedro or a Piotr, I'm sorry you didn't make the picture last night, but <laughs> Peter, go ahead. Thanks, Pete. Um, so at FOSDEM, for the last few years, we have been organizing a DNS BOF. Um, and this year, earlier this year, we managed to get, get a dev room for half a day. Uh, we had no trouble filling it with speakers. Um, but next February, we are going to fill a full day. We have some commitments for NL, from NLNet Lab, CZNIC, uh, PowerDNS, ISC, but we could use more speakers on various subjects. So if you're planning to come to Brussels and you shoot, then please also submit a talk to us. Thank you. Any questions about that? Thanks. All right, that concludes the, the first morning session. We're going to have a short coffee break. Everyone uh, come back here when the bell dings. That'll be about 11 o'clock. Thank you. <laughs>